In Flanders' fields the poppies blow Between the crosses, row on row, That mark our place and in the sky The larks still bravely singing fly, Scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived, Felt dawn, saw sunset glow, Loved and were loved. And now we lie in Flanders' fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep. Though poppies grow in Flanders' fields. John McCrae wrote this on the battlefield of Ypres, May 3rd, 1915. John was a Canadian who fought in World War I, and one of the things he noticed was an enormous amount of poppies springing up on the battlefield after only less than a year of war. And in today's video, we're going to explore exactly why we wear a poppy and how did they come to be a battlefield remembrance. If you're new around here, my name is Ashley and I'm a soil scientist. And on this channel, I usually take that science and apply it to all things gardening, but also houseplant care. And in today's video, since it is Remembrance Day or Veterans Day for those folks in the United States, I thought it was a good day to talk about exactly why poppies suddenly started popping up on the battlefield. Was it an angel's way of letting those soldiers know that there's light at the end of the tunnel? Or can science explain exactly what was going on there? So I will put a warning at the beginning of this video. I will be showing World War I in particular footage. And so if you are at all sensitive to more imagery, then this video may not be for you. I will not be showing blood in guts, but I will just be showing normal, I think natural things that we should probably see when it comes to war. I grew up in Canada, uh, going to pretty much every Remembrance Day ceremony since the dawn of time. And I can thank my father for that. He is very into Canadian war history, and so Remembrance Day was a day we definitely remembered what sacrifices our ancestors gave us. Now, I have two great uncles that served in World War I, so that also, you know, hits a little bit harder home to me. I know war can be a polarizing topic in and of itself, so I'm just gonna take the neutral ground and talk about the plant side of things, which is obviously the poppy. So we're gonna be going over exactly how these popped up and kind of what conditions needed to be there for this to happen. Now, while I was researching, it was really difficult to find any theories or topics on the idea of why this happened. It seems as though plant blindness, which we've done a video on as well, tended to win out in this scenario and very little research by any sort of science group has been put into the mix when it comes to the poppy. So a lot of these theories are my own or splices of theories that people have talked about that I agree with. But other than that, there's not a lot talking about exactly why they started popping up, but there is a logical reason for it. So poppies were found all over the battlefields across the World War I landscape. They ranged from the Western Front, which was located in France and Belgium, but also were found all the way in battlefields in the Ottoman Empire, particularly near, you know, Istanbul area, which would have been considered Constantinople back when World War I was a thing. Because they were found all over the battlefields, I can hazard a guess that a huge amount of seeds were actually transferred on the boots, the animals, and the field artillery wheels as it was moving from area to area in the mud itself. This is actually very common for things like invasive species and hitchhikers to kind of tag along. So 
that probably would explain more of the wide broadcast of the poppy seeds over time. So it is important to note that while most countries use the red poppy to be able to signify remembrance or veterans day there is also the blue cornflower which is used by the french in france in particular and the reason for that is because while there were poppies there were also cornflowers that were popping up specifically on the french front lines so that is kind of an interesting fact at the end of the video, I will be going through all the different colors of poppies that you can wear, wear and the meaning of each of those, along with the Canadian Legion um, guidelines when it comes to poppies, when to start wearing them, how to wear them, how to dispose of them, and what do you do if you find one just laying on the ground, for example. But because we want to look at where a lot of the poetry and the letters that were written home actually came from, we are going to be particularly focusing on no man's land on the western front which I like I said is Belgium and France area it was not just John the Canadian who wrote in Flanders fields there's actually a lot of different poetry and a lot of different letters that were written home even by air like by pilots who were flying over no man's land and noticed the sheer volume of poppies in the area. So this was notable, especially considering how damaged the landscape had looked. These flowers were popping up all over the landscape. So no man's land in and of itself is a really bizarre place. Um, it is known as a very, very dangerous place in World War I, but it was also known for the 1914 Christmas truce, for example. And even sometimes there have been photos that came out of soldiers that were sun tanning in the middle of war in no man's land. But for the most part, this area was known for enormous amounts of tragedy and Wilfred Owen described this from the battlefield. It looks like the face of the moon, chaotic, crater-ridden, uninhabitable, awful, and abode with madness. So exactly what was no man's land? What was the whole area? What did it look like? And I'll insert some photos of aerial, aerial views of this area but i want you to imagine two groups that were fighting there was the allies which consisted of canada britain russia italy romania japan and the us and they were fighting against the enemies which were germany hungary bulgaria and just the ottoman empire in its entirety which is now known as turkey greece Macedonia, Romania, Jordan, and Egypt. So we have two different sides and each side dug trenches on either side of no man's land. So no man's land was the area between trenches that no one had claimed to. The German enemies, they didn't have any claim to that area and neither did the allies. But on the French Belgium side, there was almost a zigzag looking trench that ran a very long length of time. And then you would have had barbed wire. And this barbed wires would have been meters thick. And the barbed wire was placed in front of the trenches. And from what I've read over the years, Barbed wire in particular was put there not so much to guard against um, enemies just running directly into the trench that was protecting the, the, the soldiers or the military group that was in that trench, but it was actually used to corral enemies into very specific points. So they would run into a specific area of the trench and then be gunned down by the military force that was inside of the trench. So we have a zigzag pattern of trenches going back however many kilometers. And then we had barbed wire. And then we have no man's land, which is a mass of landscape that didn't have any work done to it. There was no soldiers that could get into it really because it was in the range of all artillery fire, both field artillery from the allies and 
and then larger art artillery on the enemy side. And then we had more barbed wire on the enemy side and then again a lineup of trenches after that. That's where World War One is drastically different than any wars after it. So because No Man's Land was in the reach of some of this heavy artillery, some of this stuff had ridiculous names like one that I found was the Big Bertha, which is a German artillery, artillery fighter, I guess you could say. They kind of look like a mix of modern day artillery with old school cannonball artillery. So this was in the range of those guns and the trenches were pulled back from those ranges. This ammunition that landed in No Man's Land was a combination of two different types of ammunition. There was explosive ammunition and then there was the shrapnel ammunition. Both sides used both forms. So the shrapnel version was essentially a shell that was packed full of something such as ball bearings that would then be shot and would explode and would be used to actually hurt or harm soldiers. And the second form, which is the form we hear about when we're talking about poppy development, is the explosive form and so in the explosive form what they did is they packed full these shells with explosive ammunition and then they put something called an impact fuse inside of that so that one once the artillery shell was fired if it hit something like a building or solid ground it would then explode and the purpose of that wasn't to actually kill soldiers. Well, it obviously did hurt soldiers. The main purpose was to demolish buildings. And so it would blow an entire building apart if it did hit. But what ended up happening is no man's land because there was such a distance between trenches and guns like the Big Bertha couldn't actually get to any infrastructure or key zones in a lot of cases. Um, a lot of this fire was just almost like suppression fire that landed in the dirt and the soil in no man's land. And when it did hit, because it was designed to explode, it made massive pits. And these pits, if you've ever watched the movie, I think it's, oh, I think it's 19, You'd have to, I'm not sure, is it 1914 or 1950? Someone let me know in the comments down below. I think it came out last year and they do a really good shot and really good view of how big these trenches were. Essentially, if you fell in them and they were filled with water or anything like that, you couldn't, you simply just couldn't crawl out of them. They were that deep. They were, these things hit with that much force. So essentially at this point we have two major landscape changes. We have first off the digging of the trenches. So we've literally disturbed the soil really deep down to the point that we can hide an entire military force and men underneath a trench. So, I mean, your average human is five foot five to six feet on the ally side and on the enemy side. So you have to think how deep those trenches were, they were many many feet deep so we're disturbing the soil very deep down in the profile and we're tossing it up on top then we have artillery fire that is making massive divots in the ground and again disturbing soil very deep in the profile and tossing it back up on top of the topsoil so those are two very important factors that we need to remember as we're going through this now we have a more disturbing factor that we need to include and that is actually the addition of organic material and i mean this with complete respect i do think that the death toll both for animals and humans in this area added up and contributed to the development of the cornflowers and the poppies in these fields we have a military force on both sides living eating and breathing we have their animals eating living and breathing and therefore we just have daily waste both in food fecal and just human daily living matter so we have that combined with an enormous amount of 
dead and decaying bodies. There was 7.5 million Allied troops that had died over this entire time period, and there was 5.5 million Central Powers or enemies that had died in this time. And while there was a slight gentleman's agreement to allow the retrieval of human life, it was not so much a gentle's agreement to retrieve things like horses and not always a gentleman's agreement to retrieve bodies that were farther off on the Western Front, closer to enemy lines. It was estimated that in World War I, 16 million animals were used, and I can't comment on how many of those were on the Western Front, but they did range from anything to horses, goats, pigeons, and even dogs that were trained to eat rats, deliver messages, all that fun stuff. Actually, fun fact, when I was looking up the amount of service that animals actually, and the role that animals played in World War I, there was a German woman who was interviewed around World War I, and she was quoted as saying, they have taken my son, they have taken my husband, and now they take my dog, Dick, a black lab. So German citizens, anyways, were actually required to surrender their pets for the military force. But you always hear me say this, and I still stand by this statement, any organic material is more of an insurance policy for the future. Very rarely, especially when we're talking about dead and decaying bodies, would that transfer into nutrients immediately after death or even within the first you know year or so so i started thinking well what was the big factor here what caused such an injection of nutrients and i think this is important to look at because we turned up the soil we all know that topsoil is our hands down most nutrient dense layer when it comes to soil as we move down into the profile or we start digging up and putting you know lower profile soils on top we end up losing a lot of that nutrients a lot of that organic material and we start getting into you know dead soil for lack of a better term so because poppies are heavy feeders i i knew that the nutrients would have to have come from somewhere it can't just grow poppies in soil that's essentially lifeless so it got me thinking, what else was in no man's land that would have been readily available in 1915, May 3rd, only a year after the war had really started and only months after that Western Front was being dug up and actually made. And then I remembered that artillery fire and I thought, what are bombs made out of? Well, they're made out of fertilizer. I googled what was used for explosive artillery in World War I, and the answer came up with something called amatol. So amatol is a mix of 60% TNT, 40% ammonium nitrate, which is a fertilizer, and so these bombs exploding or in some cases not exploding because you have to remember they were installed with a fuse so if the fuse was forgotten it wouldn't have detonate, detonated or if the fuse struck mud for example this was a huge issue in world war one the fuse would not detonate and it would just leave this bomb sitting there so it had to strike hard ground which meant that there would have been a lot of excess ammonium nitrate in this relatively inert soil. Ammonium nitrate is an incredibly available form of nutrients that would be readily available within that first growing year for the poppy. So now we have two major factors. We have rototilled soil that was from deeper in the profile that's been fluffed up and uncompacted and thrown on top of topsoil combined with a massive injection of organic material plus essentially fertilizer. What's the last ingredient we need to make Flanders fields? Well, it's the poppy seeds. So where did they come from? So if we look at this area before war broke out, we know that this was farmland and that go 
goes for both the French and the Belgium side. Now, because of the types of crops that were grown, in my mind, I look at poppy seeds and how you would grow them in your garden and you need an incredible amount of sun. They say part shade, but they do the best in full sun. So my personal theory is that the poppy seeds were probably in those upper layers of the profile, but because the crops cast too much shade, that they didn't germinate. The other thing that I believe happened is that over time, the poppies probably were there in the beginning, but as the land was cultivated and it was monocropped, the poppy seeds were pushed most likely farther and farther into the soil profile and poppy seeds only germinate when they are on the very surface of the soil. I know this from planting my own poppy seeds. If you put them in the garden, you are best to just break open the pod and actually just sprinkle them in the area and not cover them over at all. That's how much exposure to sunlight they do need. So I think over time as the straw would have built up from the continuous cropping in those areas, we would have just pushed those poppy seeds farther and farther into the profile, which would have forced them not to germinate and actually go dormant. Fun fact about poppies is that the accepted theory is that they can actually lay dormant for up to 80 years. If that land had only been cultivated in the last 100 years and it was native grassland before that, that would mean that there would be poppy seeds that would have been in that soil from the previous landscape. This is a very common theory. It's actually a fact and archaeologists, paleontologists, so many different studies actually use this whole concept of seeds and where they sit in the profile to do things like date civilizations, see the diets of past um, areas or certain animals, and they actually use the distance in which those seeds are placed in the soil profile. So this isn't a new idea. This is actually an idea that multiple different studies across the board use. So what I think happened was when the artillery shells hit or when the trenches were dug, we started digging into the past and we actually lifted out native poppy, native prairie seeds that would have been in those grasslands out of the soil profile, out of that cultivated topsoil area and we tossed them on top. And when that happened, we had a cold snap which would have been the winter of 1914, 1915, which would have triggered the vernalization that they would have needed. And then it would have meant that when 1915 spring happened, the poppies germinated. Due to the abundance of nutrients, they did very, very well. And because of lack of competition, I mean, there's really nothing else growing there. It's not like there was seeds being sown or crops being planted in no man's land. Let's face it, the poppies thrived. And to this day, you can actually see the poppies not in the cultivated farm fields that are now placed back as cultivated farm fields, rather in the ditches around the battlegrounds. Over time and the years as they gone on, went on for World War I, those poppy seed pods would have been left, they wouldn't have been harvested, and they would have fallen to the ground, they would have been cracked, they would have been mixed in with mud, and then they actually would have been tracked all across the Western Front and potentially into other countries, such as the Ottoman Empire. Now, poppies in and of themselves, especially field poppies, are found across the planet and they can survive in zone one all the way to zone 10. So they are great at making it anywhere that they ever so please. But I think the wide broadcasting of the poppies rather than localized um, areas was most likely due to foot traffic and the field artillery and the amount of mud because there was no, t there was no grass or there was no covering in these battlefields the mud would, and the seeds would have stuck to a lot of this equipment, to a lot of the men, and the poppy seeds would have been broadcasted across the entire area. So I think that is just so amazing that that is why these soldiers started to see all this stuff. They 
essentially dug up the past, threw it on top, and then here we are today. So let's get into exactly how to properly wear them and the different colors of poppies. Because I actually didn't, when I started reading the Legion's uh, website, this is the Canadian rules for poppies. It may differ from country to country. Let me know in the comments below if it does. I have people that follow from literally all over the world, the United States in particularly, there's a lot of you guys. So let me know if our rules differ in any way. but. I didn't realize some of the stuff, especially more so to the end when it comes to disposal or what to do with your poppies or what to do when you find a poppy. So let's just jump right into that. So you're supposed to wear your poppy on the left side over top of your heart. So in this general area, it can be on your t-shirt or it can actually be on your jacket. It doesn't really matter. You're supposed to only use a pin and you're not supposed to obstruct the poppy in any way. So mine currently is just held on with um, the pokey pin that you can literally stab yourself with. I know that people put the Canada flag in the middle. Legion didn't say that that was the way you're supposed to do it. My understanding is you're supposed to show both the red and then the black center. But what I did find out that was really interesting is you can actually go to your local Legion in your area and this black center, you can purchase a reusable pin that is a plastic black center that just like pops onto the back. So that's kind of a fun fact. And the Legion, Canadian Legion, finds that completely acceptable. Um, my understanding, any other sort of pin in the middle is actually not acceptable. But then again, Legion seemed really chilled out on the rules when it came to poppies. They just kind of said, do what you think feels right. So I don't think it's like a huge deal if you do it any other way. If you're allowed to start wearing your poppies the last Friday of October. So this year it would have been October 30th that you could start wearing your poppy and you're supposed to wear it through to November 11th. Now you can choose to take off your poppy after the ceremony that you decide to attend or after the ceremony that you watch on TV now for 2020 or you can take it off at the end of the day but you don't have to just wear it through remembrance time. There's actually a rule that you can wear it for any sort of veterans funeral, any sort of veterans um, commemoration of any sort, and specifically for Canadians, any anniversary of Vimy Ridge, you are allowed to wear your poppy. So that's also very interesting. So, what do you do when you're done with your poppy? Well, you're supposed to store it respectfully. If you want to keep it, you can keep your poppies every year. However, I have a rule where I have to buy a new poppy every single year because when you do purchase a poppy, while they are free, if you have the opportunity to donate, it actually goes to the Legion and just the veterans in general. So I do buy new poppies every year. I do keep my poppies also, but only because I didn't know the actual rule for getting rid of them. If you so choose that you don't want to keep your poppy year to year, do not throw it in the garbage. What you're supposed to do is on November 11th, you're supposed to go to your local cenotaph and you're supposed to remove your poppy with the pin and everything and place it on the cenotaph itself. You can plop it into an actual wreath or you can just lay it on um, the monument. And I didn't know that. I don't know if they reuse them. I'm not sure what they do with them. That is an interesting thing to know. So if you ever are wondering what to do with your poppy or how to respectfully dispose of it, you are supposed to put it on your cenotaph November 11th. Now, if you find a poppy on the ground, you are supposed to pick it up. COVID obviously changes this a little bit, but in a normal year, you are supposed to take it home, you are supposed to clean it off, and then you are supposed to save it until November 11th when you can drop off whatever portion of that poppy you do have, and you can put it on the cenotaph itself. So there's also a fun fact. Well, let's get into the colors. I couldn't find much on the reason for the red and the black other than the fact that that those are the poppies those are the field poppies specifically a certain type i'll put the name here this is the actual type that is found 
on the western front those are red and black that is the only reasoning i found behind that color is that is what the soldiers actually did see so that is why you wear red and black it completely just signifies remembering the sacrifice that soldiers new and old have played to give us this wonderful planet that we currently live on and next one would be the blue one which is a cornflower and that's specifically used in france and again specific specific to just remembrance in general the next one is the black poppy um so the black poppy is actually for the african black and caribbean contributors to the the war efforts and so if you guys didn't know this um africa the caribbean all were involved in all the world wars to date um so world war one and world war two and i'm not specific as to what roles they did play or um where particular they were you know positioned or where they were all i know really for the most part is the canadian history of the war i you can even ask me i don't even know what the americans what wars that they were a part of or which ones they fought but i do know the canadian ones so that is the purpose for the black poppy the purple poppy is actually in remembrance for animals so that is those now millions of animals that have sacrificed their lives or just their way of living from the pigeons to the dogs to everything else in between interestingly enough when i was researching the purple poppy and kind of why it portrayed to animals they even included whales in sea life that would have died or perished to date in wars that were at sea so there was one quote from a soldier that said that whales were essentially in the no man's ocean and they were just um at times in the crossfire when they just didn't even know so that is actually an interesting fact so that is what the purple poppy is for and then white poppies are highly contested i can see kind of why i've never worn a white poppy i don't actually know anyone who's worn a white poppy but it is one of the four there's only four accepted colors and those are the four accepted colors and so white is contested because it stands for remembering that these men and women sacrificed their lives for the life we have now and they fought great evil but that the overall goal is for peace and correct me if i'm wrong this is more so on the american side but the reason why the white is so highly contested and like a sore spot for a lot of people is because it discredits in some people's minds the wars going on today or the wars that have gone in in recent years so i think that's more so why the white is contested i don't know 100 percent but the moral of the story is is that the poppy you wear should be a natural poppy color a naturally occurring color because you have to imagine that what they saw on those fields was horrific they probably didn't see a lot of green <laughs> or any sort of living anything so to be able to see fields of cornflowers and poppies was probably pretty unbelievable to these men so please respect that keep them natural native colors as much as possible and yeah hope you guys enjoyed this video i hope you have an awesome remembrance day or veterans day if you're in the united states be sure to watch at least one movie whether it be a silly military movie or one that's a little bit more heavy-handed i do think it's important to um take the time to at least one minute of silence just reflecting on what these men and women and animals have done for the world i just couldn't imagine a planet with hitler running around that would be awkward so <laughs> let's just take the time to uh thank these men and women they've done an unbelievable job i know that you're probably not going to be able to get to a cenotaph this year or you won't be able to really watch a Remembrance Day ceremony other than on the TV, which is unfortunate in and of itself. 
but still try to take the time and just um, thank the heavens and the people that are there for what they've given us. I'm gonna leave it at that. I hope no one found this disrespectful. I did not mean it in any disrespect. I just thought it was really interesting and a topic that no one's really talked about. It's, it falls in that plant blindness category. Have a safe, happy holiday, and I will talk to you guys next time. Bye.